Prince blew the door open for the idea of just being yourself. Like Paul McCartney, he can do it all. Wrote great songs, sang great songs, iconic figure visually. There wasn't really much in popular music that Prince couldn't do. He really was the whole package. If I gotta die, I'm gonna listen to my body tonight. They say two thousand years, you body lovers out of time. So tonight, don't like it tonight. Tonight, tonight. Now say it one more time. What role did drugs play in the life and the art? of Prince. Two Harper Medical, Paisley Park, 7801 Audubon Road, 7801 Audubon Road for a fail down that treating. He was found alone already in the early stages of rigor mortis in his home. Prince, the legendary musician, died at his home in Minneapolis at the age of just 57. This man is one of the most committed artists I've ever known, and he was able to do almost everything. To say that he was prolific would be an understatement. His genius was unrestrained, it was unstoppable. One of Prince's greatest talents as an artist was to connect, to engage, to compel. People couldn't look away from his music. They responded to Paisley Park uh, to look for him and found him unresponsive in the elevator. We have no reason to believe that this was a suicide. I had roommates that worked for the Bangles, and he wrote a song uh, under the pseudonym Christopher called Manic Monday for the Bangles. So I got to see some bangle, bangle gigs free backstage, and he came to perform with them on the encore. Somebody said, uh, Sid, have you met Prince? And I turned to my right, and he was standing there, and I noticed he was a striking looking guy. And he made eye contact, said, hello, nice to meet you, that kind of thing. And then he went on stage. Man, he could pick that guitar. Prince he was one of the most naturally gifted artists of all time and also one of the most mysterious. In the 80s, at a time when other megastars such as Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, and Madonna were delivering an album every three years or so, Prince remained prolific to an almost inhuman degree. He wrote his first song when he was seven years old, and he went on to sell over 100 million albums, 100 million albums. He became one of the most iconic artists of all time. He contributed to fashion, he contributed to film, he contributed to music. But the one constant in his life that sustained him and sustained his creativity was his work ethic. When you play all those instruments, write all those songs, he was doing what he should have been doing in life. Prince was such a perfectionist. I mean, we're living now in a time of auto-tune. You know, the vocals you hear are not even relatable to what actually comes out of their mouth. Prince, on the other hand, was very, very, very detail-oriented. And to everything he wanted to do himself to make sure it was to his exact specification. So everything from playing the instruments, the production, obviously the stage performance, he would make the other people in his band watch the stage performance right after they came off off of a show and if anyone like messed up a note if they messed up a move on stage he would berate them and make them promise that next time it would be perfect a byproduct of his inexhaustible output was prince's tendency toward wayward self-indulgent career moves that sometimes alienated even his most ardent supporters his influence is unparalleled, and his legacy will live on through his inspirational music. One of Prince's greatest talents as an artist was to connect, to engage, to compel. People couldn't look away from his music.
Prince arrived on the scene in the late 70s, and it didn't take long for him to upend the music world with his startling music and arresting demeanor. He rewrote the rulebook, forging a synthesis of black funk and white rock that served as a blueprint for cutting-edge music in the 80s. Prince made dance music that rocked, and rock music that had a bristling, funky backbone. One of the things that Prince will always be remembered for is the way that he could change genre of music absolutely fluently, whether it was pop or rock or funk or R&B. And he didn't just do it album to album. He would change completely the style of music from song to song on an album. So what was so revolutionary about this man is that he was completely fluent across a wide range of styles of music and he loved use them together in different ways and experiment in a way that no one really did that to that degree before or since. From the beginning, Prince and his music were androgynous, sexy, and provocative. His colorful image and revolutionary music made Prince a figure comparable in paradigm-shifting impact to Little Richard, James Brown, and Jimi Hendrix. Not only did he release a series of groundbreaking albums, he toured frequently, produced albums, and wrote songs for many other artists and recorded hundreds of songs that still lie unreleased in his vaults. With each album he released, Prince showed remarkable stylistic growth and musical diversity, constantly experimenting with different sounds, textures, and genres. Loved all kinds of music. One of his best quotes was that all my friends like a certain type of music, but I like all types of music. I listen to James Brown and Steve McMahon. And that helps explain why he appealed to the broadest possible audience. Occasionally, his music was inconsistent, in part because of his eclecticism, but his experiments frequently succeeded. No other contemporary artist blended so many diverse styles into a cohesive whole. Purple Rain, Around the World in a Day, Batman and Diamonds and Pearls have sold more than 2 million copies apiece. Purple Rain alone sold 13 million copies and topped the album charts for nearly half a year at the height of Prince's reign in the mid-80s. As Rolling Stone contended in 1989, perhaps more than any other artist, Prince called the tune for pop music in the 80s, imprinting his Minneapolis sound on an entire generation of musicians, both black and white. The product of a broken home, Prince found refuge in music. Prince grew up in a very musical household. His father was the leader of a jazz band and his mother was a vocalist. So from a very young age, he had his parents performing and adults around him that were involved in the music industry. And by the age of 14, he already could play many different instruments, including the guitar, the drums, the piano, which really, if you think about that early of a start, being that proficient in that many instruments, it doesn't really surprise that at such an early age, he got songs. At 19, he got his first record deal. When he was at school, one of his school friends who later worked with him professionally said he was, he was always the guy when everybody else was taking a, a coffee break, going to have an ice cream, going to waste a bit of time. Prince was the one who would keep practicing, keep playing, keep performing. And when they came back, he was still there. When they went out again, he was still there. When they came back, he was still there. Where I was leaving school, and I looked down, and I seen this guy go in front of me. And he was a shorter type guy, I didn't know. Then down the line, I figured out, and we used to call him Skipper. That was the only name I knew him by until after he made his album. The one time I, I really noticed was that when I'd, uh, I would always see Prince playing the keyboard, right? And I thought he was a keyboardist, right? Then all of a sudden, he got off the keyboard and sat on the side of the stage and started playing Carlos Santana. That's the first time I ever heard him play the guitar, and it was masterful. By his early teens, he'd mastered multiple instruments and was fronting his first band, Grand Central. A demo tape by the young prodigy resulted in major label interest, and an 18-year-old prince signed to Warner Brothers insisting on the right to self-produce his music. 
he was brought to the attention of Warner Brothers Records by a local Warner Brothers representative who said that we have this fantastic kid in uh, Minnesota and you've really got to hear him. And they signed him up and they said, and we think he's so good, we're going to have him work with Maurice White. They recommended that he work with Maurice White, the recently deceased eminence of Earth, Wind and Fire. Now in the late 1970s, you couldn't get a hotter producer than Maurice White, unless it was Barry Gibb. It was a complete surprise that Prince said, no, I'm going to do myself. And, and he did all the instruments himself. So even from the ages of 17 and 18, he was completely determined to be in charge of his own career. Prince released his first album, For You, in April 1978 to minimal fanfare. Soft and Wet introduced his erotic approach, while I Want to Be Your Lover and Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad from subsequent albums, Prince suggested his musical range and significantly upped his profile. Interest in the youthful star was further kindled by Dirty Mind, a provocative and sinuously funky album that appeared like a directional marker at the start of the 80s. The jittery, new wavish When You Were Mine became a club hit, yet Dirty Mind largely proved too hot to handle for the radio. The Dirty Mind album was quite unfit for radio airplay. For princely reasons you can imagine. Although uh, When You Were Mine was a great song, uh, which has become a standard of sorts recorded by various artists, including Cyndi Lauper. And we really didn't know if he was going to put it back on the rails until controversy came out. And now at this point, this was four albums in four years, and this was the pace at which he was going to continue throughout the 1980s. Prince's breakthrough was 1999, a self-produced double album made at his home studio. He'd toned down, if not entirely tamed, the hardcore sexuality, and the longish, danceable tracks appealed to disco and the new wave fans alike. Whereas many saw divisions in culture, in terms of everything from musical preferences to skin color, Prince formed a party-minded unity around the various audiences' shared interests in dance, music, sex, and romance. His look really takes those kind of components that we see in Mark Bolin, in David Bowie, and some of those early glam rock in, in, artists that have become so iconic, and then it mashes it together with funk. And of course, if you look back at David Bowie, at Mark Bolin, at those sort of artists, they love jazz, they love the blues, they love black Motown R&B. And the difference is they were putting, of course, like a white British spin on it. Prince comes from the middle of America, and obviously he's African-American. And so there's something about it that makes it more authentic, and yet it's still familiar to a lot of listeners because of what came before it. I think 1999 is the album, the fifth album, is the one that breaks him. I was working at a record store, and I'm gonna venture that in 1981, 82, working at a record store in Hollywood, California, no one but the clerks in the record store knew who he was. Up until the internet age, when downloading and then streaming took over, the record store dominated, and the record store and that one kid in each school in the Western democracies, there was always one or two kids, but at least one, that was hipper than thou and had all the records and knew who all the artists were. They would know who a guy like Prince was first. And then they tell the public in the store and radio plays and it snowballs. And I don't think outside of the clerks in the record store I was, I don't think anybody really knew who Prince was. I really don't. The LA Times reviewers would have known and Rolling Stone would have known, but the man on the street wouldn't have known. But 1999, with the revolution and all that crowd, that's where you start getting... He's so good, he's throwing out offshoots like The Time and Morris Day and then Wendy and Lisa went solo. And he could, you know, from that point on, in a few years, he can give away a song like Nothing Compares to You to Sinead O'Connor. I and mean, that's how good he was back then. Prince was bursting at the seams with talent, giving away hits, giving away hits. 
Incredible. I remember being nine years old and all of us kids were out playing softball like at recess and we were all singing Little Red Corvette. And you look back now and I'm like, wow, like those lyrics, hmm. And you look at the, how provocative the video is and you look at Prince in his resplendent velvet and ruffles and gems. And it is in some ways, it's so not it's not threatening. It isn't scary in the kind of way. It isn't like it isn't like over the top sexual because he's not naked or anything like that. But it's so over the top sexual in the lyrics and in the way he's writhing around and in the way that he's dressed. And I think you know you think about what comes after that. Think about where we are now too. The provocative has changed so much, but I think that really kind of sets the tone for you. Don't have to show. It's your showmanship, not showing your body, I think, that is so incredibly powerful about Prince. One of the defining releases of the 80s, along with Michael Jackson's Thriller and Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, 1984's Purple Rain elevated Prince from cult hero to superstar. The movie, loosely based on his life story, was set in Minneapolis and his real-life hangout, The First Avenue, and the 7th Street Entry Club. Prince wrote the treatment and played the lead role. When you think about Prince, you really kind of imagine what you see in the video for Purple Rain. First of all, he's in purple, he's on stage, he's performing, he's a superstar, and he's putting out this very sexy, powerful stage presence. I think Purple Rain is an incredible song. It's an anthem of sorts. And, you know, there's a lot of apocryphal imagery. Prince was asked about it many times, and he did have a real fascination at the time about the apocalypse and the end of the world. And Purple Rain is really about when the sky turned red and blue and rained purple, and it's the end of the world, and it's being with the person you love and your God at that time. That's what Prince is basically alluded to later in life. The film grossed $80 million, and the album, which won Prince an Oscar for Best Soundtrack, rained hits for a year. Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy, and When Doves Cry being the standout tracks. In When Doves Cry, the video opens with Prince naked in a bathtub, and it's a, a, a bit of a startling image because of how feminine he looks, but at the same time, he has this very masculine, sexy energy. He gets out of the bathtub, and we see this kind of revealing shot of his washboard abs, and he kind of crawls across the floor in this very naked, feline way. It's really interesting to watch this video because you see Prince and clips of Purple Rain where he's this rock star with this very troubled home life. You see him on stage and then you see him rushing home where his stepfather is abusing his mother and he has to kind of pull him off his mom. She's never It, it puts Prince out there as a leading man, but it's also a very sexual way to start the video. Uh, we didn't see a lot of musicians, male musicians at this time, putting themselves in, out there in this way, like to start out naked in a bathtub. Um, but that's really very much a part of the hypersexualized image that Prince was already putting out there. The album was number one for 24 weeks in America. It's one of the longest runs ever. He was everywhere all over the radio. It's, it's, it's one of those examples. It happens very occasionally, but when it happens, it's delicious. 
when uh, the radio audience can't get enough of a particular artist. We had it with Elvis, we had it with the Beatles, we had it with the Bee Gees, uh, we had it with Michael Jackson. Uh, more recently, we had it with Adele, but then we had it with Prince. You had uh, two immediate number ones, When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy. In the video for Let's Go Crazy, it's quintessential Prince. You've got him on stage in tight trousers and a ruffled blouse with a high neck, performing with a guitar and looking very sexual and in control. Interspersed in the video, you have scenes from Purple Rain, sex scenes with the beautiful Apollonia, showing her, her, her courtship and seduction by Prince, and also some of the scenes of his very troubled home life. It's a, it's, it's a long music video and it feels very much like an advertisement or trailer for the film. For any other artist, Purple Rain would have been a hard act to follow, but Prince already had another album in the works, Around the World in a Day. A tour de force of psychedelic soul released in 1985, it became his second consecutive number one album and the first to appear on his own Paisley Park label. With Prince Mania in full effect, the album generated two more top ten hits, Raspberry Beret and Pop Life. Even a bad film, Under the Cherry Moon, Prince's first real miscue couldn't halt his momentum, as the accompanying soundtrack, Parade, included the classic Kiss, his third number one single. In the video for Kiss, we see Prince in this very sexy two-piece outfit. The top almost looks like a woman's uh, exercise midriff top, and he's wearing like black lycra leggings. It's a very feminine, androgynous look for Prince. A lot of Prince's um, breaking down of barriers had to do with the way that he was appearing to be two genders at the same time. And in this video, we see him in a way kind of prancing around as if he's a very sexy woman in heels, bearing her midriff. But at the same time, he's a very much a man who is masculine, who's sexual, and who wants a woman. So it's an interesting combination, and it's, it's a motif that Prince would play with throughout his career, including ultimately wanting to be called a symbol that was both male and female. Prince hit an artistic peak with Sign of the Times in 1987. Sign of the Times was Prince's most musically expansive and lyrically incisive album. Sign of the Times was the first pop hit to make reference to AIDS, the disease of the 1980s. And he even recorded it first a year before it came out. But uh, even after that year's wait, which nobody knew was a wait, it still was a breakthrough. That's how ahead of the, of the times he was. On the sobering sign of the times, Prince enumerated a catalog of social ills over a skeletal funk track. Other hits of the album included You Got the Look, a duet with Sheena Easton, and I Could Never Take the Place of Your Man. Around this time, Prince talked of dueling identities within himself, conjuring characters that represented his good side, Camille, and dark side, Spooky Electric. The latter had its say on the Black Album, a controversial, hardcore set that was aborted shortly before its intended release. In its place came Love Sexy, which contained the terrific Alphabet Street. Commercially, Prince found himself back on top in 1989 with his soundtrack to the first Batman movie. Prince's dense, tangled funk meshed with film producer Tim Burton's dark, gothic vision and resulted in the album Batman and single Bat Dance shooting to the top of the charts. That was so audacious when you think about it. Uh, Tim Burton, with that film, A, giving Jack Nicholson basically co-lead, as the Joker, but B, just saying to Prince, give me a soundtrack. And it was fantastic. Number one single, Bat Dance. A year later, Prince made another of his own movies, Graffiti Bridge. Although it was panned, the double album soundtrack was compelling, particularly the impassioned Thieves in the Temple. 
In the early 90s, Prince assembled a backing band, the New Power Generation. They debuted on Diamonds and Pearls, Prince's most accessible and hit-filled album since Purple Rain. Everything about it was elaborately conceived, including the holographic cover. The album returned Prince to radio with a string of funky, upbeat hits, Get Off, Diamond and Pearls, Money Don't Matter, Tonight, and Cream. The video for Cream is about as sexy as you would think it would be when it comes to the name of the song and the kind of performer that Prince is. You see him dressed in his full ruffle neck blouse, in his tight pants and high heels, gyrating on the stage with very scantily clad women in kind of like bodysuits. At one point, he is humping the stage, he's prancing around, and it's a very hypersexual song. The lyrics are sexual, the video is sexual, and it's a celebration really of the naughty side of Prince that people really kept coming back for. Diamond and Pearls would turn out to be Prince's biggest album of the 90s. It was followed in 1992 by an album that marked the first appearance of the symbol that Prince would formally adopt a year later as his name. Ironically, the disc whose title was a symbol, and therefore referred to as the Love Symbol album, opened with a song called My Name is Prince. The numerology minded seven peaked at number seven, but Prince's most infectious funk workout, Sexy MF, proved too profane for radio. Still, Prince seemed to be on a roll. In August 1992, he signed a contract extension with Warner Brothers for six more albums, and he acquired the title of vice president with the label. However, by the mid-90s, relations would sour as he began appearing in public with the word slave scrawled on his face while agitating to get off the label. In the 1999 uh, BET Tonight interview, uh, Prince talked about perhaps one of the most controversial things that he did was, was to change his name from Prince to the artist formerly known as Prince or the artist, or and he created a love symbol to, to represent that. And what was fascinating about what he said was, and controversial about what he said, was he described himself as a slave. And he makes it clear he's not talking about the kind of slavery that African Americans had to endure when they first came to, the, to, to America. That's not the kind of slavery he's talking about. He says, yes, he says, it's relative. Prince was in a trap. Prince was in, under contract to, Prince was owned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, no, I can't use Purple Rain. I can't use this song. I can't sell the song Purple Rain now unless I record it again, mm -hmm. which I have plans to do if I can't, in fact, get the master recording that I believe is uh, one of my children, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So um, uh, I did. I had to get freed from the uh, the mentality of being a slave. You understand? Right. Okay, and that's not to equate myself with the same uh, situations that we suffered coming to this country. But, you know, everything is relative. If you are owned, you are owned. If you can't do everything that you want to do, if there's a ceiling and you're not allowed to go as high as you can go, you are in fact a slave. Rather tellingly, he says, if you're owned, you're owned. And if you can't do everything you want to do, then you're a slave. And that sums up both Prince's desire to control his own destiny and his obsessive compulsion to be the best possible artist that he could be, which is that kind of rare drive that only artists of the caliber of Prince and only an artist like Prince could do. That is what made him what he is. In 1983, Prince launched an independent label, NPG Records, with a various artists' compilation, 1-800 New Funk. His next single, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World, which also appeared on NPG, marked a return to hit-making form. Prince's video for The Most Beautiful Girl in the World is one of his most romantic videos that he made in his career. It was the first song released on the album right after he changed his name to a symbol. And it was a, it was a different kind of 
prince than we were used to seeing because this was a prince who was very much in love. He, this, the woman who inspired the song was his then fiance, Métis Garcia, who he ended up marrying shortly after he shot the video on Valentine's Day. The video is all about marriage. There's a beautiful bride and prince is standing there looking quite regal in red and he's singing about this woman who is the most beautiful girl in the world. You don't see Prince gyrating, humping, getting naked, other things that you see on Prince videos. This video is romantic, it's a celebration of love, and it very much reflects the state of mind that Prince was in himself when he made this song. Meanwhile, relations with Warner Brothers, to which he was still contracted, were deteriorating badly. The release of the gold experience was delayed while he argued with the label. Disenchanted with what he saw as an unfairly one-sided relationship between label and artist that rendered the latter a slave, Prince was let out of his contract with Warner Brothers in 1996. His last album of new music for the label was Chaos and Disorder. After being liberated from his former label, he quickly resumed his prolific ways. Distributed through a special arrangement with Arista, Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic gave Prince the best of both worlds, artistic ownership of his work and major label distribution. The album was notable for its production credit, Prince, which marked the first time he'd reverted to his old name in six years. In February 2004, Prince appeared with Beyonce at the Grammy Awards, playing his own Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy, and Baby I'm a Star, along with Beyonce's Crazy in Love. A month later, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. During the closing ceremony, he played the song-ending solo on George Harrison's While My Guitar Gently Weeps, wowing the assembly with his ferocious virtuosity. And they are doing While My Guitar Gently and uh, for the first three minutes or so, Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne are trading lead vocals. It's one of those usual superstar jams. And then Prince has a minute long guitar piece and he tears the roof off the sucker. And, and there he is with all these famous people on stage and he is stealing the show completely. And at the conclusion of his solo, he throws his guitar in the air. And in the clip, you don't see the guitar come down. But from the eye line, you see that he's just looking to make sure that his roadies caught the thing. And then he walks off stage with the gait and look of, well, I've now done what I came into this world to do, <laughs> and, and, and leaves. Together, these performances made Prince the talk of pop music again. Something similar would occur when he played the 2007 Super Bowl halftime show. Prince's Super Bowl performance in 2007 is widely believed to be the best and greatest Super Bowl performance of all time. Critics absolutely were blown away by his stage presence and the magnificence of his performance. You have to picture the scene. It's in Miami and it is pouring rain. It's one of the only times it has poured rain at halftime in the Super Bowl in history, if not the only time. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. Over 100 million people watch. Now let's face it, they're not all 
pop rock music fans. So you're getting into some homes and you're appearing before people that don't really know who you are. They may not have even heard of you, despite you being a huge name. He was certainly, certainly a very popular guy, but he was perhaps not the household name he had been in the 1980s. It was drizzling that morning and they called Prince up and said, uh, it's raining, you pretty much have to go on anyway. And Prince said to the TV producer, uh, it's a famous story in America, he says, make it rain harder. And of course, the, he could get shocked. And he is jamming on it. He's kicking it. I mean, all of these people are, and it's raining. It's raining. And Prince is out there, and he, first he's got a Telecaster, a Fender guitar. And then he switches to the, uh, the, the lyre-shaped uh, famous Prince guitar. And he plays these beautiful solos. He's jamming it. He asks them to sing this high part. He's got them doing the choruses of his hits. How cool is that? That unlike some kind of cheesy, come on, everybody sing. He says, I want to hear y'all. And everybody starts going, oh, you know, as he, oh, it's fantastic. And it's raining. They're dancing all around him, and he's playing this guitar. The band's cooking. It's the best Super Bowl halftime we're ever going to have. From mid-2010 through the end of 2012, Prince toured throughout Europe, America, Europe again, Canada, and Australia. During 2013, he released several singles, starting with Screwdriver and continuing with Breakfast Can Wait in the summer of that year. All this activity was a prelude to the spring announcement that Prince had re-signed to Warner Brother Records, the label he had feuded with 20 years prior. As part of the deal, he wound up receiving the ownership of his master recording and the label planned a reissue campaign that would begin with an expanded reissue of Purple Rain, roughly timed to celebrate its 30th anniversary. In the same way that Prince is hard to pin down when it comes to one musical genre type, Prince was very much an enigma across his entire career. He refused to be pinned down even in terms of gender. Was he male? Was he female? Was he gay? Was he straight? Was he black? Was he white? He was, he was definitely black, but in some of his videos, he has so much face powder on, he looks completely white. His style of dressing, it's, it's masculine, but it's super feminine. His sexuality was very much a male predator who was gonna seduce a young woman, but he was also hyper feminine. Prince was an enigma in that you couldn't really put your finger on who and what he was, and that was part of his appeal. The months leading up to Prince's death is, is an extraordinary tale in itself. At the beginning of April, he, he canceled a couple of concerts. Uh, ostensibly because he was poorly or, but it was actually to give him time to recover from what was then an, an, an opioid addiction. Uh, on April the 15th, he's on a plane and nobody knows really what happened on that plane uh, or what the exact sequence of events was. But we know the end point of that was Prince being taken very ill and falling unconscious. He was administered with Narcan, which is an anti-opioid medication. And this, in effect, if you put it rather graphically, kicks the opioids out of the opioid receptors and helps normalize the, uh, the breathing and, and, and other bodily functions which the opioids had disturbed. He's then asked to go into hospital. He's supposed to be in hospital for a few days. Uh, he checks himself out after three hours. In addition to all of the reports about Prince's clean living, his veganism, his Jehovah's Witness beliefs, there are also a wide array of reports about his opiate addiction, about his love of pills, and some of the less kind of clean living uh, things that may have happened towards the end of his life and in fact contributed to his death. 
I'm thinking, so here's this guy, five foot two, and he's been on heels for 38 years. Surely he's got to have hip pain. And he's taking painkillers. Well, I could easily understand an addiction to painkillers or an overdose to painkillers. Dr. D, who claims to be, Prince is a drug dealer, and again, we don't know whether this is the case or not, said that he never met anybody who suffered as much stage fright as Prince. And this ties in to the narcissism that was at the heart of his personality. The man who, on the one hand, has to be bigger, greater, and grander than the rest, carries that private vulnerability, that naked, raw insecurity, which is part of the drive that makes him perform. The man who, on the one hand, is too frightened to go on stage, yet when he's on stage, he's too obsessive, too driven to come off it. That combination is toxic, as well as responsible for the work of so many great artists. And perhaps that's what artists like Prince, that's the price they pay for the creativity. It's the, it's the Faustian pact, if you want, that they make. Give me my creativity. Give me my art, and I will give you my life. So if Prince use drugs, either prescription or, or illegal. His publicist, Chris Poole, his former publicist, Chris Poole, suggested it wasn't for recreational use. It wasn't because he wanted to get high. It was to feed the monster that was within him, which is what drove his creativity. It was to feed his creativity. So let's just look at that sequence of events. First of all, he cancels concerts because of his addiction. Then, because of his addiction, he falls unconscious on, on, a, on a plane flight. He then is, a, is taken to hospital because of his addiction, where he's, he's asked, told to stay, but he checks himself out. And there's two things going on at that moment when Prince says, I'm out of here. One is, his intolerance of being told what to do. And that's not a, a comment, there's not a judgment on, on Prince or anybody else who, of that iconic stature, of which there are very few artists who reach that stature. But he's used to getting his own way. If he doesn't want to stay somewhere, he's not going to stay. And the second thing, perhaps, it's his narcissism, his sense of invincibility. I can cope. It's denial. I can cope. I can leave here, I'm fine. But of course, he wasn't fine. And the cancelling of the concerts and the incident on the plane and him being put into hospital were all signs of what was to come just a few days later. Two way car for a medical, Haley Park, 7801 Audubon Road, 7801 Audubon Road for a fail down, not treating. Rescues and surgery, you know. And CNN has now confirmed that the artist Prince is dead. He was found in his elevator, unresponsive, in his compound, uh, Paisley Park in Minneapolis. The, the number of songs, seven-time Grammy winner, 30 nominations, the number of songs that have touched people's lives throughout uh, his entire career. Uh, this is going to be very, very hard news to take. The last 24 hours of Prince's life are really a snapshot of what happens in the final stages of opioid addiction. Opioid use begins in euphoria, in pleasure. It ends in despair, disintegration, and death. Effectively, opioid addiction in its final stages breaks down all the body's physical and mental systems. Emotionally, the opioid addict is depressed, anxious, angry, confused. Physically, all the major organs are affected, the heart, the brain, and eventually everything breaks down and the addict dies. So if we look at what happened to Prince during these last 24 hours, it begins with 
a representative, one of his representatives, calling for a, a specialist to come over from California to help him deal with this addiction, because obviously people are noticing it's in its final stages and he needs help. And what is extraordinary is that the specialist himself doesn't come because he's busy, can't make it. So he sends his son, sends his son, presumably because Prince ended up in his house alone on the evening of the 20th and the morning of the 21st, the specialists did not do enough either to help Prince and obviously not enough to save his life. Because those last few hours he spent in his recording studio, we can only imagine what happened after that. And the, the systemic and slow erosion of his mental faculties and his physical body culminated in him presumably drifting into unconsciousness and dying in the lift at his home, alone. They responded to Paisley Park uh, to look for him and found him unresponsive in the elevator. We have no reason to believe at this point that this was a suicide. But again, this is early on in this investigation and uh, it's continuing to, uh, we'll continue to, to sure. investigate. Sure. You received the call at 10, 12 yesterday morning to come and assist the Carver County Sheriff's Office in this investigation. Our chief medical examiner arrived on the scene at 11.30 yesterday morning, local time, and was on the scene for several hours. The autopsy this morning began at 9 a.m. Central Daylight Time and concluded at 1 p.m. And just shortly, I received word that his body did leave Midwest Medical Examiner's Office and was released to the family. So the last moments of Prince's life was spent in the lift at his home. And it's said that he overdosed on fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's like 50 times more powerful than morphine. It's an incredibly potent opioid. Uh, and it's used for, as all opioids are, uh, principally for, for pain relief. And, uh, but what opioids can do is they can slow the breathing, can slow the, the body system down, can lead to lightheadedness, can cause you to faint, to drift into unconsciousness, coma and death. So we can speculate that maybe Prince left the recording studio feeling faint, perhaps lightheaded, maybe a bit unsteady on his feet, thinking he might just take himself to bed, rest, sleep it off, get up the following day and continue what he was doing because he was notorious for his work ethic. He would work you know, all hours, God sends. He was an incredibly resilient and ferocious in his work ethic. But he may have felt it was too much, so he may have felt tired, sleepy, exhausted. Maybe he got in the lift, who knows? He may just have rested against the side of the lift, the back of the lift, and, and, and thought, oh, I just feel tired. And he may have drifted into unconsciousness, then drifted into a coma and then died. And that's probably the most likely sequence of events that uh, would have made up the, the last moments of Prince's life. Uh, I, I know a guy that uh, knew him because he, his sister worked for Prince. And he said, uh, he said Prince was surprisingly normal, one-on-one, -on -one, I stress one-on-one, -on -one when he was in the record company sphere dealing with executives or in a crowd or on stage, he was Prince. But one-on-one, -on -one, this guy told me, Paul, that he was a, a regular guy saying, hey, you, your sister's doing really great for me. I really love her. Uh, you tell your mom I'm taking care of your sister. And Paul would say to Prince, oh man, that's great. And, and uh, th that's ultimately the guy that uh, so few of us got to know. We know the icon and the legend, but look at the reaction. Uh, when these people die, they're irreplaceable. And that's one reason you see this massive pouring of public grief, this outpouring of public grief, uh, because they're irreplaceable. And, and secondly, because they've touched so many hearts.
it seems unbelievable, but really it's not that unbelievable when you think about America right now is in the midst of a crisis of opiate addiction, whether that's Oxycontin, whether that is, is heroin. And I think one of the things that was so shocking about Prince, here's someone that seems greater, bigger, better than a, a human human, than a person, and yet it's the very same sort of drugs that you know, that, that more normal people are experiencing issues with and is killing people that was the demise of Prince. And that I think makes it, in, in one way, it brings him down to being just a normal person. But in some ways it's like, well, here's someone that has access to any and everything. And yet this very common item, this prescribed drug is what ends up killing him. We're finally getting on top of that epidemic now, but doctors were passed legal prescriptions. So, uh, Prince became an addict. He was not experimenting. He was not self, well, he was self-medicating, but he wasn't trying to find nirvana and he wasn't trying to obliterate himself because he had a rough childhood. His bloody knees hurt. He was in pain, as was Tom Petty. Tom Petty refused to give up his final tour and disappoint his fans. So he was, uh, had the bad hip and both these guys, uh, it weakens your body to, to use these opioids. And it's just, it's, it's beyond tragedy. The fact that Prince died, he was younger than I, the fact that Prince died, you know, another 20 years of work to do, it's, it's just terrible. And uh, it, it, makes me, it makes me choke up to just think about it. It's just what a waste. A more responsible American medical practice or medical culture would have saved us a lot of trouble. Here's a person who combined uh, elements of James Brown with Jimi Hendrix and did it at the highest level of the world. And then in the meantime, was also controlling every single element of production of his music. He was a perfectionist of the highest order. Uh, he knew exactly what he wanted. He understood every single element of his music from, uh, and that means all the technical elements as well as the creative elements. And he, uh, he controlled every one of those elements. All along, he was also involved with the mastering, with the actual engineering process of his records. Now, there aren't a lot of people that do that now. I mean, that was uh, uh, that was one of the things that set him apart. Uh, but he was definitely ahead of the curve when it came to um, the business part of a distribution, gaining control of his catalog. He drew attention to Minneapolis in the international music world, and. That, as a result, if you made music in Minneapolis, it was more likely that you would get noticed because people were already looking at it because of Prince. Because of Prince, Prince's presence here and because of what he accomplished, and that as a result made it a, 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 a more visible place for musicians to work in. And that's a huge thing. And you know, this thing that became known as the Minneapolis Sound, that sort of r and uh, Prince, that, that came from Prince. Anytime you got an opportunity to watch him play was an extraordinary, was an extraordinary thing. Um, he, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a bright light. To sum up Prince's legacy would be about his sheer raw talent, a guy who could play every single instrument on every single track, on every album, who released 39 albums in his career and left thousands of songs in a vault in his home on his death. I get the impression that no one need worry that they did not get the best of Prince. Because the best of Prince, it would appear to me, was not what he held back, but what he gave out. So in fact, we all got the best of Prince. If the world has different pockets that can embrace him, why can't America have its pockets that embrace him? He, he proved it was possible and that it could be done. And uh, I wish there were more people like him. I wish there were more people that, that didn't just go through the barriers, that crushed the barriers. I mean, when I saw Prince play the last three times of the four I saw him, everybody was there. That's all I can say. 
there wasn't a recognizable, sizable demographic of any slice of American life that wasn't there. All enjoying the music. What a great thing to say. Wish it was me.